Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it is good to see each one of you. Thank you, uh, particularly Sarah, for just stepping in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I really thank God for you. Uh, yes. Uh, Kevin, too. Th thank you for leading us in worship. <laughs> well, well, as you've heard, my name is Kinyo, and I have the awesome privilege to serve here as the minister and the awesome privilege to bring God's word to us. Now, I don't know how your week has been, uh, but mine, I'll share a little bit about mine. It has have, I've had extremes. I've had highs and I've had lows. I've been on the mountain top. I've also been to the deepest of the valleys this week. Uh, and I want to share uh, just one experience that I had this week that uh, wasn't a good experience, but strangely turned out to be a very good experience. I, I received uh, news that a distant mentor uh, of both Alice and I um, passed away, went to be the Lord, uh, died this year, uh, died uh, at the age of 91. His name is uh, Stuart Briscoe. Uh, Stuart, uh, I think I have a picture of him and his wife, Jill. Uh, they have been married for almost 70 years. And yeah, it's such an amazing, amazing life. Uh, Stu um, has written very many books that I, as a young Christian, I grew up reading them, and uh, I had the awesome privilege of meeting Stu and Jill around 2012. A very humble couple, uh, very down to earth, very ordinary, very wise, very witty, and uh, uh, it was just an honor to meet with him. But just a little bit more about Jill and Stu. Jill and Stu are originally from uh, Manchester, England, but have lived most of their life in Wisconsin uh, leading a church. Now in their time in Wisconsin at Elmbrook Church, they, had, uh, they have invited very many young people to come into their lives and uh, invested in them. One such couple, uh, then they were single, was John and Tim Ryder, that, that couple over there. And uh, Stu and Jill invited them into their space, uh, invested in them, prayed with them, in fact, in a letter that Jan wrote to us last week, she said, um, all, most of the things that we know about ministry, about missions, about life, we have learned from Stu and Jill Briscoe. Such a great legacy, right? And uh, Jan and Tim uh, later on ended up being missionaries in Kenya. Now, I'm originally from Kenya. They were in Kenya for 35 years. And part of their time in Kenya is that they got to serve in the same church that Alice and I uh, were serving, and they were our colleagues. And what John and Tim did was the same thing that Jill and Stu did f to them. They became our friends. They invited us into their space, into their life. They invested and poured their lives into ours. Uh, when we were dating, when you're going through the uh, wedding uh, things, when we, when we are having a very rough time uh, in, uh, earlier on in marriage. How many of you know that uh, marriage is hard? You know, <laughs> got thousands of hands across the room. And these guys just came and embraced us and walked along with us and journeyed with us in our most difficult and toughest moments. And not only that, they challenged us to love the Lord. They challenged us towards ministry. They are the ones who actually really challenged us to come to New Zealand. They said, look, uh, we are Americans. We came as missionaries, but I think it's time for you to go out as missionaries. And they are part of the reason of why we came to New Zealand. And when we came here, they actually came all the way from Kenya to visit us. And they had just retired and they were on their way back to the U.S. And so they decided to take a long route back to the U.S. through New Zealand. And so they came and spent some time with us. And it was such an encouragement. They, they poured their lives in our lives. And so you're probably wondering, okay, Kinua, thank you. Thank you for all that information. Why are you telling us all that information? I'm glad you asked. The reason is... While it was sad to receive the news of the passing on of Jill, Stu, of Stu, 
it was such a privilege for me to reflect on his life and his impact and influence on John and Tim and many other people and we have been beneficiaries of their ministry. They poured into other people's lives and these people poured their lives into ours. And we have been beneficiaries. We are like third, fourth spiritual generations of Jill and Stu Briscoe. And we thank the Lord for that. So while it was sad to receive the, the news of the passing on of, of, of Stu, there's a moment of thanksgiving and praise for his life. Such a beautiful legacy, such a life. And we, as human beings, all want to leave a legacy. Don't you want to leave a legacy? I want to be of impact and of influence in this life. Well, friends, the book that we are starting this Sunday for the next couple of weeks, the book of Second Timothy, is a book about a gentleman who left a faith legacy. Just as it was for Stu and Jill, to John and Tim, to many of us, is the same thing that we will see of Paul to Timothy. Here's the thing. We all have something of value to pass on to someone who is coming after us of a different stage and season of life. And so as we go through the book of 2 Timothy, I want to see the faith legacy that Paul left. Paul left a legacy, Stu and Jill have left a legacy, but also you have something of value in your life that you can pass on to someone. And probably you don't think much about your life, whether you're a Christian or not, this message is for you. Whether you're young or old, this is for you. Because God has deposited something of value in you. For some of you, it's your life experiences. Both the good, the bad, and the ugly. And life is like, our lives are like a, chest, a treasure chest. We have something inside that is of value. That thing could be very nice experiences. Some of it could be not so nice experiences. For some of you, you have been married for a long time. You've had good, a good run, 30, 40, 50 years in marriage. And I thank God for you. You have something that you can give younger generations who even think, don't think highly of marriage. You know it has been tough. There are those times it has been easy. But you can share those experiences to those who are coming after you and those ones who are in a different season and a stage in life. For some of you, you're thinking, I have not had a good marriage. Actually, I've gone through a divorce. And you're thinking, I do not have anything to offer. But you know the heart and the wounds that you go through when you're going through a separation or divorce. You can leverage that for someone who's coming after you. Maybe there's a couple that you need to warn about some things that they're doing that is going to lead them down this road. You know the pain of separation. Or probably you can walk along someone who has gone through this and journey with them. For some of you in life, you have built good businesses. You have made a lot of money. You have, you have a lot of wealth. You have something, some wisdom, some experience that you can leverage for someone who's coming behind you. For some of you, you have won awards. You have gotten prizes. You have gotten medals in life. You have gotten trophies. You have won many things. And there's something that you can share about your life and your experience that you can leverage that experience to someone who's coming after you, who is in a different stage and season in life. For some of you, as you are trying to build those businesses, 
trying to win those awards, you know that it was so hard because some people did backstab you in the process. <laughs> it was never easy. You got hurt. You got injured. And you have the wounds and the scars to show. It was your friends or your families that talked ill about you, that even wanted to kill you. Just as a point here, for those of you who are older, let me tell you to something about we younger people respond to. It's not just your awards, but actually also your scars. The more we hear how you have struggled and the scars that you have had, the more we are drawn to you because we realize that you're human and we can identify with you. You are so real and you're so authentic. And you can leverage that for someone who's coming after you in a different season and stage in life. But also some of you have scars and skeletons. in your life. You'd rather that we did not see them or we did not know about them. You'd love these skeletons to be buried deep down so that no one will ever know. Yet probably that's the same thing that can be used to help someone else. And some of you have had a strong faith you have held to the cross of Christ through thick and thin. You have endured. You have persevered. And we need to hear those testimonies of faith. We need to hear how even through the hard times you held on to Christ. Each one of you has something to pass on, especially those among you who are Christians. You have faith, and it is of value and of importance, and you should, could, pass it on to the person who's in a different stage and season of life. You have something of value. Your life is like a treasure box, a treasure chest, that has many things that could be leveraged and help someone who's coming after you. What we will see for the next couple of weeks is a man who leveraged his experiences and his faith for those ones who came after them. Paul used his experiences and, and life to, to pass it on to this young man called Timothy. But it was not just Timothy. Actually, if you go to the book of Romans chapter 16, there's a whole list of about 24 people that Paul had invested their lives in. And the star student was Timothy. Most of us, when we think about Timothy, we think about the, his mission journeys, we think about the many churches that he started. But at the point of his death, the last letter that he wrote he wrote not to the churches, but to someone in particular called Timothy. At the end of the day, what mattered were the relationships and who he invested his life to. Second Timothy was his last known letter. It's like his will and testament. These are his last words. And as they say, last words are lasting words. We normally listen intently to someone's last words. We want to to keep their wishes, their dying wishes. And so this is important to Paul as he's writing to Timothy. Just a little bit about the book of Second Timothy. As I've said, it is Paul's last letter. It is his will and testament. Paul at this point is in Rome. He has, he has been in prison before, but now he knows for sure this is it for him. He is aware that he might not get out of prison and might not get out of prison alive. In fact, as you will see, we will see later on in chapter 4, verse 7, he will say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. 
I have kept the faith. He is aware that this is it for him. So this, he writes this letter and pours his heart into it to tell Timothy, his prodigy, how he values his faith, but also values Timothy. So friends, this sermon series is for all of us. Here is why we are studying the book of 2 Timothy. The first reason, it's, it's a very selfish reason. It's actually very personal. It is, for me, as, as a young minister, I want to hear from a senior seasoned minister like Paul. What does it look like to lead a church? What does it look like to endure and to persevere as you do ministry? What does it look like to be faithful to the end? What does it look like to be faithful in passing on your faith? But this sermon series is also for you and you and you. It is for you because we need to be reminded that you have something in your life that can be used to leverage. You can leverage that for those ones who are coming after you and those ones who are in a different season and stage in life. But it is also for us all. Because as we will see through this sermon series that every generation in the church, in the Christian faith, is of value, adds value, and needs to be involved in each other's lives. Every generation is valued and is of value. Whether you are 8, 18, or 80, God has something in you and you have something to offer. You are of value and you're valued and you have something to offer. So today I'm just going to give us a broad perspective of the book of 2 Timothy and then we'll dive in into the first two verses. So let's read this together, okay? 2 Timothy chapter 1 verses 1 to 2. Let's, let's read it together in 2, 3, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Normally when we write letters today, we end our letters by signing off our names yours kindly, yours faithfully, and then you write your name and probably your signature. But in those days, you started a letter by identifying who it is that is writing. You say who you are at the beginning. You sign off at the beginning of the letter. So Paul starts by identifying himself, himself and he says, an apostle of Christ, uh, of Christ Jesus by the will of God. He identifies himself by who he is. Now, he is not glouting and telling him, okay, uh, Timothy, you better listen because I am an apostle. No, 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 no. He's, he's reminding um, uh, Timothy that uh, this that I have is not even out of myself. He says, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It is not my own making. It is God who made me an apostle, a messenger of Christ Jesus. And so this is a good reminder for me who is a minister to take my calling serious. But the same principle applies to every Christian. We all need to have the joy of knowing that we are doing a task God has given us and prepared for us. For Paul, he was to be a messenger, an apostle of Christ Jesus. For you and I, God has shaped us differently, but we are still to be messengers of Christ. Wherever the Lord has placed us, whether you're a teacher or a taxi driver or running a business or raising a family, God has a purpose and a plan for you. And Paul's first phrase tells us how he became an apostle, by the will of God, but also why. And why is it? In keeping with the promise of, of life that is in Christ Jesus. Paul's well-defined mission is to proclaim the promise of life that is experienced by those who are in Christ. So here's Paul identifying himself. And then he writes to who? To Timothy, the recipient of the letter. 
Now what I want to do for the next couple of minutes is talk about Paul and Timothy and a little bit about their relationship, who Paul was, what they had in common, but also what they did not have in common and how it's very unique that they ended up being a dynamic duo in ministry. As I said, many people remember Paul for his missionary journeys, the churches he planted, the important letters that he wrote, and that became part of the New Testament. But one of the greatest achievements was the people he poured his life into. And he poured his life in Timothy. Paul met Timothy for the first time uh, in uh, about AD 52. It's recorded in Acts chapter 16. Acts 16 says, oh, Paul came to Dab, Dab and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, and then Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. So Paul here, his planting churches, is on a mission trip, he's on his second missionary journey, and he's introduced to Timothy, and he invites Timothy into his life, into his space, into his ministry, into his mission. And Timothy says yes and goes along with uh, Paul. Uh, Timothy then ended up being a close companion of Paul to the extent that Timothy became Paul's special representative on, special, uh, on several occasions. There are times that Paul would want to go to a certain church, but he can't go there, he would send Timothy. And then later on, Timothy ended up leading a church called Ephesus. You remember the church of Ephesus? We talked about it a couple of weeks ago when you're doing the seven churches in Romans, uh, Revelation chapter uh, 2. That church had been planted by Paul, and Paul passed the baton of leadership to Timothy. And so Timothy did end up leading that church. And Paul eventually wrote two letters to Timothy. And this is his last letter. It is an urgent letter, but it is also very, very important. And in this letter, Paul reveals his wishes to, to Timothy. He, he reveals his passion and his heart and his priorities. And what are they? Sound doctrine, we will see these are the mega themes that we'll see recurring in the book of Second Timothy. That Timothy, my son, you need to be of sound or appropriate uh, doctrine. You need to be steadfast in, in faith. The word endurance is going to come up every now and then. Persevere, endure, that is going to come up very many times. The, he'll be told to not just endure but be confident in endurance. And he's, also, he's going to be challenged to continue loving even those ones who are not for him. You will see these themes throughout this letter. The thing that brought these people together, Paul and Timothy, was Christ and the cause of Christ. And eventually, Paul has this warm relationship with Timothy. And you will see Paul using these tender words towards Timothy. My son... My child, I pray for you continuously. We'll see that next week. Gavin is going to be bringing God's word next week. And you'll see that I pray for you day and night. Every time I remember you, I thank God for you. Wouldn't that be nice to know that someone prays for you? And that's the kind of relationship that they had. And you'd think that these guys are blood brothers or they are from the same family, especially now that Paul is calling Timothy his son. But they are not. Timothy is his spiritual son. They are actually very, very different. And I want you to notice the contrast. Paul was older. He was probably about 80 years at this time. But Timothy was young. He was probably about 30 years. So what could be common between these two people? Paul was more experienced in ministry. Timothy? He was a beginner. He was inexperienced. Paul had major credentials before he got converted. <laughs> Actually, in Acts chapter 22, uh, verse 3, Paul gives his credentials. He says, I'm a Jew of Jews. I, I was born in Tarsus uh, of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under this guy called Gamaliel. 
and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as you are today. So he's talking to the Jews, Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. I persecuted Christians, the followers of this way, and I and ensured I arrested both men and women, throwing them into prison. This guy had quite a reputation and some good credentials. He was zealous, he was educated, he was from the city. But for Timothy, what do we know about Timothy? He was brought up in the regions. Uh, the most we know about him is that he had a grandmother called Lois and a mother called Eunice and an absent father who was Greek. We don't even know his name. Paul was from the city, Timothy was from the regions. What do they have in common? Uh, Paul calls himself a Jew of Jews. He was a pure breed. But Timothy was a half breed. His father was Greek. The mother was Jewish. In fact, it ended up being a problem. Uh, it was going to be a hindrance that he was a half caste. Eh? Or a half breed. To the extent that Paul ensured that... Uh, Timothy had to be circumcised so that he is accepted among the Jews because it was going to be a problem when it comes to ministry. And that was the, the price that Timothy paid to be in ministry. Paul had a very strong personality. He was an intense guy. He was bulletproof, moving from one place to another. He was enduring every kind of thing, planting churches. He was an overachiever. You think you've achieved much? Try Paul. You think you have suffered? Try Paul. The guy was bulletproof. Timothy, he was timid. What do these two guys have in common? Why would Paul invite and invest in Timothy, of whom they seem to have a lot not in common? There seems to be nothing in common. The differences are stark and obvious. But yet Paul intentionally invited Timothy into his space, into his life, into his ministry, and invested in him and poured his life into him. And Timothy, on his part, this guy who was timid, he was fat. Like F-A-T, faithful, available, and teachable. Timothy was open to receive from God through Paul. Even with their differences, they made a very powerful ministry pair. So the question I bring to us, and the question that we'll keep asking ourselves as we go on, are you a Paul? Are you a Timothy? If you are a Paul, who is your Timothy? If you're a Timothy, who is, a, who is your Paul? We all have something that we can use to leverage for someone who's coming after us in a different season on stage in life. As a senior, seasoned, older person like Paul, do you see where God is at work? Do you see young people who are passionate about God and God is doing something in them, do you see God working in them? Sure. Probably asking, where do you start if you're a Paul? You, here's where you start. Pray that the Lord will open your eyes and lead you to someone specific. Pray for humility on your part. So that it's not just going to tell the other person, or the other people, the next generation, how much you know. Take the risk. We're in a culture that is very individualistic and we do not want to invite people into our personal spaces and life. But yet, as Christians, we are called to be countercultural. This is what we have been called to do, to do life together. So take the risk. Take a genuine interest in the person the Lord is nudging you towards. The Lord might not appear in a dream and tell you, go alongside that person. 
but maybe there's a friendship that is going to grow and maybe God is going to nudge or tell you or do something that just draws you to that person and you to the other person, uh, one another. Take a genuine interest. Be intentionally inviting that person into your life and personal space. Be real. Be authentic. As I said, we just don't want to hear about your our words. We also want to hear about your scars and your scars. Walk alongside them. How do you do that? Listen and listen to them. How do you listen? You ask questions and listen some more. Learn from them. Even you who is more experienced, there's always an opportunity to learn. Do you know how to tell someone who's humble? They are always they take a genuine interest and in others and always want to know about that person, even though they themselves are experienced and probably, you know, they've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. But they're genuinely wanting to know about the other person who has been made in the image of Christ, of God. So, pray, take a risk, take a genuine interest, be intentional, walk alongside them, pour your life in them, expecting nothing from them. Don't pour your life into other people expecting loyalty or anything else. Just pass on your experiences. Especially for us who are followers of Christ. We have a duty to pass on our faith. And, so, and then after that, pray some more. And pray that the Holy Spirit will move both in you and their lives. And be faithful to the end. Are you a Timothy? Young timid, inexperienced. Yeah. There's always someone more experienced and wiser than you. They may be older, they may be your age mate, they may not be. But pray that the Lord will open your eyes to whom he is leading you to. Take the risk. Take a genuine interest. Be open to humbly learn from them. For those among us who are young, we need to learn how to humbly learn from those ones who are older than us, who are wiser, more experienced, and seasoned in life. What would it take for us to humbly learn from them? Listen to them and serve with them. What would it take for us to be faithful and available and teachable, just as Timothy was? Friends, in doing so, then we will leave a legacy. But this message is especially important and nice and encouraging and challenging for those among us who are followers of Christ. And more probably you're here and you're not a follower of Christ. You have not ever surrendered your life to Christ. And there are all these good things that we are saying. But you too can experience them, not just because you have something to offer, but God has, wants something better and more for you. He wants you to have a personal relationship with Christ Jesus. And we want to pass this faith that we have received by grace to you. Here is an opportunity today for you to surrender your life to Christ and be part of this awesome heritage, legacy of faith. You too can receive Christ. Living a legacy is more than a will. It's a life well lived. Living a legacy is more than how you lived your life for yourself. Rather, it is how you intentionally invested in others. Living a legacy is more than living for your generation. Rather, it is about gospel investment to the next generation. Living a legacy is more than your agenda. It's about God's agenda. Living a legacy is more than earthly returns. It's about eternal rewards. Amen.